March 1989, a revolutionary Soviet fighter is prepared for its first flight. If it works, it'll be the world's most effective vertical takeoff aircraft, giving a new generation of Soviet aircraft carriers the ability to strike farther and faster than ever before. In July 1976, a new aircraft emerged from the shadows of the Soviet military establishment. The Yakovlev Yak-38 could take off and land vertically. It was the Soviet answer to the famous British Harrier jump jet. NATO code named it Forger. The Forger operated from the brand new Soviet aircraft carrier, Kiev. The combination of carrier and aircraft gave the Soviets something they'd never had before, the ability to maintain a naval air presence across the oceans of the world. The history of Soviet naval aviation was long and troubled. It was formed in 1919 after Lenin had taken an interest in the development of Soviet air power. In the course of the Civil War, the fledgling naval aviation squadrons flew more than 2,000 missions in support of the Red Army. During the Civil War, a British Avro 504K was shot down near Petrozavodsk. The plane was immediately taken to a factory outside Moscow and closely examined. It was redesigned to become the U-1, nicknamed the Avrushka, one of the most numerous Russian aircraft of the 1920s. It became the standard Air Force trainer, and a float plane version was also developed to supplement the growing armory of naval aviation aircraft. Naval aviation received another boost in 1924 when the Red Air Fleet was presented with the Lenin Squadron of 19 new R-1 aircraft. With the assistance of a German engineer, a float plane version of the R-1 was designed and called the PM-2. About 400 were built and put into service. By the 1930s, the Beriev Design Bureau was establishing its monopoly on seaplane and flying boat development. This is the Beriev BE-2. It flew for the first time in 1931. It was an efficient aircraft, but by the early 30s, there were many within the Soviet military who were convinced that Soviet naval aviation needed more than flying boats. They wanted an aircraft carrier. As war again began to engulf Europe, officers of the Soviet Pacific Fleet warned of an ominous threat from the east. The Japanese Navy had built a powerful force of carrier groups equipped with efficient fighter aircraft. This meant they could launch airstrikes through the Far East and Pacific, giving Japan a firm grip on the region. Soviet admirals also kept a keen eye on the naval power of another country, America. The American military, all too aware of the difficulties encountered in establishing airfields in less hospitable regions, had long relied on carriers as the backbone of the Navy. As the prospect of another world war became more concrete, US carrier forces in the Pacific prepared to play a major role. On December the 7th, 1941, the warnings of the Soviet naval officers about Japan were vindicated. The victim, however, was not the Soviet Union. The United States suffered a surprise blow at the hands of Japanese aircraft launched from six carriers. In one strike, the US lost five battleships, two destroyers, and more than 2,300 lives.
With a successful raid on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese consolidated power in the South Pacific with a strong network of bases. Far away from the conflict between America and Japan, the Red Army was totally committed to its own bitter struggle. The German forces had penetrated to within a few miles of Moscow. In one of the bloodiest conflicts in the long history of Russia, the Red Army desperately defended its homeland. In 1943, after the victory at Stalingrad, the Russians launched a counter-offensive, driving the Germans from the Volga, the Crimea, and from Leningrad. The Great Patriotic War was primarily a ground war, but the infantry depended heavily on the close support of the IL-2 Sturmovik. Soviet attack aircraft and light bombers helped clear the way for the battle-hardened Red Army, while Yak and MiG fighters protected the skies overhead. Although Soviet naval aviation fought against the Germans in the Crimea and the Baltic, ground forces absorbed the main thrust of the German invasion. And it was the ground forces that ultimately drove the Germans from the Russian heartland in a military reversal few would have predicted at the end of 1941. The victory of Soviet land forces against the Germans was seen by the military hierarchy as a vindication of the view that aircraft carriers were not necessary. After the war, therefore, seaplanes and flying boats were again emphasized as the cornerstone of Soviet naval aviation. Just as the world was recovering from war, another conflict began to develop in the Far East. The Soviet military watched intently as the North Korean army charged through the 32nd parallel and US Task Force 77 hurried to the region in response. Carrier-borne Panthers, Sky Raiders and Corsairs bombed and strafed for weeks in an effort to gain breathing room for the UN ground forces. There were no adequate airfields in the Korean theater of operations and the importance of carrier-borne aircraft in this conflict was immense. The success of the US task forces did not go unnoticed in the Soviet Union. In Moscow, Stalin ordered a great increase in the number of surface ships, submarines, and naval aircraft. The lack of a warm water port had long frustrated the Soviet leadership. By the early 50s, it appeared that Stalin, aware of the power and swiftness of Allied task forces, was conceding that far-reaching blue water strength could only be obtained through a carrier-based air arm. But when Stalin died of a stroke in 1953, the chance that a Soviet aircraft carrier would be developed also died. The rise of Nikita Khrushchev brought a new era for the Soviet military. Khrushchev was not a champion of an ocean-going navy. He felt that rockets and missiles were the weapons of the future and that surface shipping was virtually obsolete. Khrushchev felt that a naval long arm should be spearheaded by long-range naval aircraft capable of executing offensive strategic missions against enemy submarine ships and land targets. As a result of Khrushchev's theories, the Soviet Naval Air Force was equipped with several Tupolev Tu-16 Badger bombers. The modified Tu-16s, given the name Badger B by NATO, were equipped with two nuclear anti-ship 
cruise missiles. They had a standoff range of up to 186 miles. Another modification, the Badger D, was especially equipped to give electronic guidance to the missiles fired by their companion aircraft. Unique wingtip-to-wingtip -wing refueling from other Badgers gave the naval air arm the long-range capability demanded by Khrushchev. The Soviet Naval Air Force received an additional boost from one of the most successful long-range aircraft to come out of the Soviet Union, the Tupolev Tu-95 Bear. The Tu-95 made its first public appearance in 1955 at the Tushino Air Show and soon established itself as the premier Soviet bomber. Equipped with its four powerful counter-rotating turboprops, the Bear had a range of 7,185 miles. Its maximum bomb load was 20,000 pounds, a fact that many Americans found unsettling. In the early 60s, several Tu-95s were modified not to bomb the American heartland, but for action against U.S. carrier task forces. The modified Tu-95, codenamed Bear B, was prepared for two roles. The more benign version was used for naval reconnaissance. The other version carried a large anti-ship kangaroo missile under the fuselage. The Soviet Navy was also beginning to rely heavily on the submarine, which would soon become a launch pad for nuclear weapons. Although long-range strategic aircraft like the Badger and the Bear had assumed an important role in Soviet naval aviation, the use of flying boats had not diminished. The Beriev Design Bureau, based in Taganrog on the Sea of Azov, was uncontested as the Soviet Union's foremost designer in the field of hydroaviation. In the summer of 1960, Dr. Georgi Beriev was finalizing tests for the world's first jet-powered flying boat. In 1961, the Beriev BE-10 was unveiled at Tushin. It went on to set a dozen world records in speed, distance, and payload. While the Soviets developed their naval air force, Western countries conducted experiments in VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. In 1953, the British successfully hovered the Rolls-Royce flying bedstead. This bizarre-looking machine had two Rolls-Royce Neen turbojets mounted horizontally with the jets deflected straight down. The French were also experimenting with VTOL. This is the Snecma Attar Volant. As the name suggests, it was really just a flying jet engine manufactured by the Attar company. The large engine was mounted vertically. It propelled itself and its intrepid pilot straight up, supported only by a pillar of jet thrust. The next French development was another Snecma creation, the Coléoptère. The design philosophy of the Coléoptère developed directly from the Attar Volant. In both, the engines were mounted vertically, but the Coléoptère used a large ducted fan instead of pure jet thrust. This prototype crashed, but the ducted fan was successful in later VTOL experiments. On the other side of the Atlantic, Americans were also examining the possibilities of vertical takeoff aircraft. In January 1954, the Bell Aircraft Company conducted the first flight of their test vehicle, the ATV. 
This hybrid aircraft with Cessna wings and a glider fuselage was built to test the theory of tiltable jet engines. Tilting the engines of the ATV allowed the pilot to make the transition from vertical to level flight. Like the French, the Americans also used ducted fans to go straight up. The Doak VZ 4DA had two ducted fans mounted on its wingtips. The Chrysler Corporation decided that wings were not necessary. The Chrysler model simply used two vast ducted fans. The Ryan Company retained the idea of only one lift engine. This is Ryan's 1951 test rig, which would eventually develop into the X-13 Vertijet. The Rolls-Royce Avon turbojet engine was chosen for the X-13 because it had the highest thrust to weight ratio of any engine available. On April the 11th, 1957, test pilot Pete Gerrard guided the X-13 off the support trailer for the first time. Transition into level flight was achieved and the X-13 flew like a conventional jet aircraft. In order to land, the aircraft needed to make the transition back to hovering flight. Landing on the mobile trailer was impressive and potentially dangerous. A nose hook had to be guided back to a cable which rose to support the three and a half ton machine. This aircraft may itself have had little military potential, but it was an important step in the development of vertical takeoff and landing systems. The X-14 was another major advance in VTOL design. Wing-tip nozzles controlled the role of the aircraft. Their effectiveness had been tested by early computers. Tail-mounted nozzles worked with tail surfaces to control yaw and pitch. But the major advance in the X-14 was the ability to redirect or vector the jet thrust downward. Vectoring of engine thrust would become a key element in future operational VTOL aircraft. By 1958, the British had come a long way from their early experiments with the flying bedstead. Rolls-Royce was now getting considerable support from the British government for their lift engine concept. The result was the short SC-1, which achieved its first transition from vertical to horizontal flight in 1960. The SC-1 had four engines mounted in a central compartment for lift and one mounted horizontally in the tail for forward thrust. Control in the hover was achieved by a combination of swiveling the lift engines and using reaction control valves in the nose, tail and wingtips. In Moscow, sheer necessity was forcing Soviet authorities to find new ways of launching aircraft. The Cold War was intensifying, and by the late 50s, the Americans were flying U-2 reconnaissance missions over Russia at an increasing rate. To counter this penetration, the Soviet Air Command adopted a radical way of getting interceptors into the air quickly. The MiG-19, an effective fighter interceptor, played a key role in the defense of Soviet borders. A new version was equipped with powerful rocket boosters, these rockets propelled the aircraft skyward from a mobile launching sled.
The use of rockets for this early form of Soviet VTOL was appropriate. Khrushchev was a great admirer of rocket power, and in the endless game of countermeasures played during the Cold War, Soviet rocket-assisted takeoff became an important factor. In 1962, relations between the East and West suddenly deteriorated. U.S. reconnaissance flights over Cuba detected the presence of medium-range ballistic missile bases just 90 miles from the coast of the United States. Military analysts were stunned by the amount of Soviet military hardware already in place in Cuba. With the world on the brink of war, the Kennedy administration sent a naval task force to set up a blockade. Just as it had with Korea, the Soviet military establishment watched while a dominant naval arm successfully protected the interests and policies of the United States. U.S. naval success in Cuba revitalized the debate on a Soviet naval long arm. The idea of a small Soviet carrier was seriously discussed. Aircraft designers like Alexander Yakovlev soon realized that if a smaller carrier was developed, an appropriate aircraft would be needed. Yakovlev, the designer of the famous Yak fighters of World War II, had not been particularly successful since the world entered the jet age in the 1950s. One of Yakovlev's early jet designs was the Yak-25, Tests of its structure and landing characteristics were carried out at the Tsagi research facility outside Moscow. Post-war technological advances gave Yakovlev no opportunity to rest on the laurels of his wartime fighters. Before the Yak-25 had finished its comprehensive test program, the MiG design bureau created a legend for the jet age, the MiG-15. Competition was increasingly intense. New requirements like ejection systems were developed, reflecting not only the unceasing technological advances of the time, but a new concern for pilot safety. The Yak-25 flew for the first time in 1953, it had a bulbous nose and fuselage and two large wing-mounted engines. It was soon noticed by Western analysts and given the code name Flashlight. The early Yak-25 was a night and all-weather interceptor with tandem seats. It had swept wings and bicycle landing gear with small wingtip outriggers. It was originally armed with a cannon, but was later modified to carry air-to-air -air missiles. The Yak-25 was not particularly successful, but it created the foundation upon which later Yakovlev interceptors were developed. This is the Yak-28, codenamed Firebar by NATO. It was similar in layout to the Yak-25, but much more powerful. It had two of the Tumansky R-11 turbojets developed for the MiG-21. The bicycle landing gear allowed space for large weapons under the wings and fuselage. Series production of the Yak-28 began in the early 60s. It soon surpassed many of the established Sukhoi aircraft in speed, range, and altitude capability. Continuing modification of the Yak-28 proved it was a flexible aircraft able to respond to the changing dynamics of the Cold War. In spite of the success of the Yak-28, Yakovlev designers appeared at some point in the 60s to break with their tradition of conventional takeoff military aircraft. Emphasis was given to the development of civil aircraft and a vertical takeoff and landing fighter. 
At Sagi, wind tunnel investigations of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft was already underway. This is a pure Delta VTOL design from the 60s. The Soviets had briefly experimented with much cruder VTOL aircraft during the mid-50s when Professor Matveyev and a group of engineers designed a test rig similar to the Rolls-Royce flying bedstead. In their creation, the Turbolet, gas flow from the main engine was fed to outrigger pipes. These pipes could be moved to tilt the jet thrust in whatever direction the pilot needed. This Delta plan form was the result of pressure to develop a VTOL design more like a conventional aircraft than the flying bedstead. Although it would never fly, it contributed to a body of knowledge that led to Yakovlev's first successful VTOL aircraft. By the mid-60s, the French had managed to get a delta-wing VTOL into the air. This prototype, the Dassault Balzac, was a modified Mirage fighter with separate engines for lift and cruise. Possible naval use of VTOL aircraft under development in the West was a concern for the Soviets. They could operate from small, inexpensive carriers, increasing the range and versatility of Western navies. In Britain, another development added to Soviet concerns. This is the Hawker XP831 prototype, making its first untethered test flight in 1963. Soon it was achieving transition into forward flight. The powerful Pegasus engines were designed by Rolls-Royce. They were continually upgraded, expanding the aircraft's flight envelope. The Royal Navy had mixed feelings about the development, now called the 1127. A vertical takeoff and landing aircraft can operate from small ships without a massive flight deck. Some naval personnel saw this as a threat to the viability of their large carriers. Moreover, the 1127 could not yet carry a substantial payload, nor could it fly at supersonic speeds. Both were requirements of the Royal Navy, but the Royal Navy's pilots were impressed. A three-nation consortium from Britain, Germany and the United States was established to undertake flight tests from the Hawker Sidley Airfield at Dunsfold. The 1127 was now called the Kestrel and flight tests began in April 1965. The Kestrel differed from the 1127 in several ways. The straight trailing edge of the delta wing was swept and the tail fin was angled down to improve stability. Stability was also increased with the use of puffers on the wingtips, which could blow up as well as down. In the nine months of tests carried out by the tripartite squadron, the Kestrel completed over 900 flights. But the military were only interested in a VTOL aircraft if it was supersonic. Kestrel had only been able to achieve supersonic speeds in a dive. Hawker developed a new aircraft, the P-1154, and called it the Harrier. In the mid-60s, the British government cancelled three major aviation projects, the TSR-2 bomber, a short takeoff transport, and the P-1154. Hawker built an aircraft that was almost completely new. They still called it Harrier, but it differed from its predecessors in many ways. It had a much larger engine with 19,000 pounds of thrust, different intakes, an improved wing, and a self-contained inertial navigation system. For the British and the West, VTOL had finally come of age. In 1967, at the Domodedovo Air Show, the Soviet Union finally revealed its first VTOL aircraft. 
The Act 36, quickly labelled freehand by NATO, impressed the crowd with its vertical takeoff and its ability to make the transition to conventional flight. Western observers were sceptical. The freehand appeared to be crude in comparison to the Harrier. Large engines in the forward fuselage fed vectoring nozzles in the rear and left little room for operational equipment. But the West saw important naval implications in the development of these aircraft. US reconnaissance satellites over the Black Sea had seen that the Soviets were building a warship much larger than the Moskva-class helicopter cruisers. It was a warship large enough to be an aircraft carrier. Short takeoff and landing aircraft were also on display at Domodedovo. This Suhoi version used twin lift engines located ahead of the main engine to thrust it from the runway. The air intakes for the lift thrust engines were located on top of the fuselage. The MiG Bureau also made a contribution to Soviet short takeoff technology with its Delta winged fighter named Faithless by NATO. Domodedovo, it was clear that the Soviet Air Force still depended very much on rocket technology to help get aircraft off the ground quickly. But short landings could only be achieved by using parachutes. Even the successful MiG-21 used rocket boosters to achieve a short takeoff run on remote airstrips. While the Soviets were showing off their hardware Domodedovo, Americans were using theirs in the heightening conflict against the North Vietnamese. Once again, America was involved in a conflict far from home. And once again, American aircraft carriers were being used successfully in bombing raids in an area where airfields were sparse. Vietnam made it clear to the world that the aircraft carrier was far from obsolete. In the early 70s, the US Marine Corps bought 110 British Harriers in a gesture that had implications for Soviet VTOL development. The US Marines had been closely monitoring the Harrier because as early as 1958, they had a requirement for a fixed wing vertical takeoff aircraft. The Harrier, newly designated AV-8A, would prove useful to the Marines, not only for its shipboard capabilities, but also because it could land in remote areas. This created concern among the Soviets who, despite the successful flights of the Yak-36, knew that the Harrier was far superior. The Yakovlev Bureau picked up where they left off with the Yak-36 and within a few years were ready to test their long-anticipated new VTOL aircraft the Yak-38. As flight tests began, it became clear to the West that the Yak-38 was being developed in conjunction with another project underway at the Nikolaev shipyards on the Black Sea, the construction of the first Soviet aircraft carrier. The influence of a West German fighter-bomber project of the 1960s and a later joint U.S.-German AVS program are both reflected in the Yak-38's design. Precision landing tests were carried out to train pilots for difficult landings at sea. Like all VTOL aircraft, the Yak-38 requires considerable amounts of fuel for takeoff 
and transition into level flight. It was wrongly assumed by Westerners that the yak was unable to make short as opposed to vertical takeoffs. This would have limited its payload and fuel efficiency. From the beginning, the purpose of the Yak-38 was clear. It was to be a naval aircraft. Flight testing finished in the mid-70s. The Soviets at last had their VTOL aircraft. Now, all they needed was the carrier. On July the 18th, 1976, the Kiev was revealed to the world. Although it was carrying over 20 Yak-38 aircraft, the Soviets did not refer to it as an aircraft carrier. It was called a submarine intercepting cruiser. This was to avoid provisions of the 1936 Montreux Convention, which forbade the passage of any aircraft carrier through the Bosphorus. The Turkish government didn't argue, and the first Soviet carrier cruised unchallenged into the Mediterranean. The Kiev, which was 900 feet long and weighed 39,000 tons, was not a large carrier by Western standards, but it symbolized the end of a 50-year struggle to get a Soviet carrier afloat. Stalin had criticized the carrier as too expensive and vulnerable, and Khrushchev had called it a weapon of the past. But for those who had survived the long argument for the Soviet Union's carrier, the event of this summer day in 1976 was some vindication. The Kiev was well armed. It had extensive missile control radar for its surface-to-surface -surface and surface-to-air missiles and a battery of rocket launchers and cannon. But of most interest to Western military analysts was the presence of the new Soviet VTOL aircraft, which NATO quickly named Forger A. The squadron of forgers has the job of intercepting enemy patrol and anti-submarine aircraft prying into airspace outside the range of the Kiev's defensive missiles. The forger also gives mid-course guidance to Soviet anti-ship missiles. The standard takeoff weight of 10 tons includes 2,200 pounds of weapons and 5,000 pounds of internal fuel. However, this load can be increased if a short takeoff is used. The forger can reach supersonic speeds, but only just. It was clocked by an American interceptor at Mach 1.05. Its rate of climb is about 15,000 feet a minute, and its ceiling is 40,000 feet. Its wing area is four square meters less than its Western counterpart, the Harrier. The Kiev is not a large carrier, and the aircraft's wings need to be folded for storage. There's an elevator in the stern of the ship that can bring one aircraft at a time to or from the hangar. This is the two-seat version of the Yak-38, known in the West as Forger B. The additional seat was added to a standard Yak-38 cockpit, and the fuselage was extended aft of the engine nozzle to maintain the center of gravity. The Yak-38 has almost three times the Harrier's risk of engine failure. This is because the lift engines need to be started twice as often as the cruise engine. 
and the Yak-38 cannot land with only one engine. The U.S. Navy was not undaunted by the emergence of the forger. U.S. Navy fighters and reconnaissance helicopters were quick to show their interest. While its attack capabilities prove to be limited, there's little doubt that the forger is capable of defending its own task force. Being a true vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, the Yak-38 can perform many of the normal functions of a helicopter. Therefore, helicopter landing pads on naval or civilian ships can be used by the Yak, allowing it to expand its effectiveness. It's difficult to estimate the success of the Yak-38 program. Its small wings and lack of thrust vectoring in forward flight make it sluggish in air combat. It's not exceptionally fast, and its payload is too small for strategic attack. But the Yak-38 program gave the Soviets a substantial and far-reaching fleet of carrier-borne aircraft and it broke the West's monopoly on operational vertical takeoff and land. In 1980, design work began on a new aircraft carrier large enough to operate conventional fighter aircraft. The Mikoyan Design Bureau planned to adapt their MiG-29 to fly from its deck. The result was the MiG-29K. K stands for Karabilny, which means naval. Its modifications include a strengthened landing gear, folding wings, and a tail hook. In the twilight of the Soviet era, military budgets were vastly reduced. The Yakovlev Design Bureau, like most other Soviet design bureaus, began to refocus its energies on more economically viable civil aircraft. But in the spirit of Alexander Yakovlev, the designer of the Soviet's most successful World War II fighters, the Yakovlev Bureau was developing yet another military aircraft. Design of the new aircraft began in the mid-70s just before the Yak-38 entered service on the aircraft carrier Kiev. Like the Yak-38, this new Yakovlev design was a carrier-based vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. But financial constraints led to delays in the program. Construction would not begin for another 10 years. The new aircraft was to be called the Yak-141, it was to be very different from its predecessor, the Yak-38. In spite of continuous upgrading and modification, the Yak-38 had not been able to overcome its design limitations. The Yak-141 designer set out to make a much more flexible aircraft. Their first step was to make it more powerful. The Soyuz lift cruise turbofan engine produced over 34,000 pounds of thrust. The two smaller lift engines produced more than 9,000 pounds each. Two prototypes were built for flight testing. The design had a split tailplane to allow space for installation of the large engine. Models were tested at Tsagi, particularly for aerodynamic and structural qualities. All vertical takeoff aircraft can expect their share of hard landings during test flights. Structural integrity tests were designed to expose any weaknesses in the airframe.
The 141's navigation and flight control systems were much more advanced than those in the Yak-38. Initially, simple simulators were used to familiarize pilots with the new control panel. More elaborate simulators allowed the pilots to experience full operating conditions. This is the first prototype, number 48. In the winter of 1989, it was taken to the Zhukovsky Flight Test Center for static testing. Yak-141 chief test pilot Andrei Sinitsin would make the first flight. He was involved in all the aircraft's ground testing. Engine failure in takeoff and landing is disastrous for VTOL aircraft. There's no time for the pilot to react. The aircraft simply drops like a brick. It was essential that engine reliability was fully established before the first flight. In March 1989, 14 years after the program began, the Yak-141 was at last ready to fly. Pilot Andrei Sinitsin made his final preparations. Here, at the Zhukovsky Flight Test Center, where the late Alexander Yakovlev had witnessed so many test flights of his military aircraft, the last generation of Yakovlev fighters was about to be launched. All first flights are conservative, and this one began in short takeoff mode. The Yak-141 showed enormous promise. In its two-year test flight program, it would break 12 world records. It would demonstrate a climb rate faster than the Harrier and an ability to reach a height of 12 kilometers in pure vertical takeoff mode. It could carry 6,000 pounds of weapons and had a range of up to 1,300 miles. But in spite of its promise, flight tests would be aborted in 1991. One of the two prototypes would crash. A rapidly diminishing defense budget would force the Yakovlev Bureau to abandon military aircraft. But in March 1989, after the successful first flight, Andrei Sinitsin and his fellow Yakovlev employees had no inkling of the momentous changes about to hit the Soviet Union and the Yak-141 program. They simply enjoyed their long-awaited moment of triumph. 